Intellectual Muscle, University Dialogues for Vancouver 2010. Sport, ethics, and technology. Is high-performance sport inconsistent with ideals and ethics? This question is explored by Richard Pound, former Olympic swimmer, McGill Chancellor, and former president of the World Anti-Doping Agency, followed by a panel discussion with Dr. Jim Rupert and Becky Scott. I'm delighted to be here, and I, I thank the organizers of this uh, seminar for the opportunity to participate in the sessions. Congratulate you for organizing uh, the seminar, and I hope that the outcomes will be what you hope. The theme of the conference is particularly interesting, since, uh, at least in my view, that the concepts of sport, ethics, and technology are inextricably linked. We start with sport. Sport is an activity governed by rules, agreed to by all of the participants. The rules are the essence of sport without which sport would not and cannot exist. The rules define the activity or game, its objective, how it is to be accomplished, under what circumstances, with what equipment, and during what period. It is this feature of sport which creates the inseparable link with ethics, which I will address in a few moments. Focus on the rules bears repeating. However, since references to them are often used to blur the distinction between conduct which is acceptable and conduct which is not. We've probably all heard someone say that such and such a rule is stupid or unnecessary or words to that general effect. And that may well be true, although there is almost always a reason for the existence of the particular rule. Time may well have passed it by as the sport develops and the equipment changes and the field of play evolves. If so, then it may be appropriate to change the rule. And in every sport, there is a governance structure which includes rulemaking responsibility. It may be a rules committee, an executive committee, a board of directors, or a congress, depending upon the level of the competition. Uh, there may also be uh, governmental laws or regulations to be considered. But in one way or another, however, the rules can be changed, and once they're changed, they become applicable to everybody involved in the sport. But, and this is fundamental to the concept of sport, the rules cannot be changed unilaterally by an athlete or team. That is incompatible with the entire notion of sport. Examples of uh, this can be seen in the internal rules adopted within each sport. There are penalties agreed upon by the participant for breaches of the rules. Using ice hockey as an example, if you try to play with seven players instead of six, there's a penalty, and you're forced to play with five players for a certain time. The same is true for improper contact, boarding, high sticking, charging, interference, tripping, and so forth. The offending player and his or her team is penalized, and the sought for advantage is turned into a disadvantage. Serious offenses, result in longer penalties, penalty shots, ejection from the game, and perhaps suspension or even expulsion from the sport. It's even possible for criminal sanctions to be applied in, in extreme cases by the public authorities. Most sports attempt to be self-regulating and autonomous, even while recognizing that they occur within an overall societal context which provides its own overlay on all activity within society. When organized sport was first developed on this continent in the early 19th century, it was completely outside the general legal system. This has gradually changed, and by the end of this century, sport will have been completely absorbed into the prevailing legal system. On the other hand, the public authorities generally do not actively interfere with sport rules, with exceptions in some cases related to health, safety, and infrastructure standards or codes. But the public authorities are content, as, as well they should be, generally to leave the other aspects of the organization and conduct of sport to the participants. It falls within sports governance, therefore, to determine the rules, to provide for their application, to review useful or necessary changes to the rules, to provide a forum in which to discuss and adopt such measures, and to adopt proportionate sanctions 
or the breach of any of the rules. Now, looking at ethics. Ethics in sport is a consequence of the agreement by the participants on the applicable rules. It's a fundamental principle of sport as a voluntary exercise that if one does not accept or does not like the applicable rules, one is not obliged to participate. On the other hand, if one elects to participate, it's equally fundamental that one accepts or is deemed to have accepted the rules. One is entitled to expect that fellow participants will participate in accordance with the rules, and the same participants are entitled to expect that you will comply with the rules. Obvious examples, and you don't need many of these, uh, are, are, include not being able to hollow out your 16-pound shot because you're not as strong as your competitors, running only nine laps instead of ten because you get tired sooner, or starting before the signal because you're really not as fast as the other folks. Less obvious, but equally problematic examples include such things as heating up the runners of a bobsled prior to a race, lying about your age when qualifications may depend on that factor, using materials which are not allowed as part of equipment, altering equipment to produce apparent scoring. We had an example of this, uh, I think it was in the 1976 Olympic Games when a Soviet modern pentathlete rigged up his foil so that he could as he thrust, he could make it look like there was a hit. A relatively recent rule in almost all sports is a prohibition against the use of certain performance-enhancing drugs or methods. It's a rule which initially grew out of a concern for the health of athletes, since many were ingesting dangerous, practically industrial quantities of the substances, or were engaged in practices that carried with them serious dangers of infection and even death. Uh, there was a, a Danish cyclist that died during the games I attended in, in Rome in 1960, the first known Olympic death, and that was kind of a wake-up call, but it took sports authorities far too long to exhibit concern over practices which were known to exist, and even longer to put in place rigorous systems of controls, coupled with investment in the research necessary to be able to identify the substances being used. But now there's an international system in place with common rules applicable to all sports, all athletes, and all countries. I can't say yet that it's applied with equal enthusiasm and vigor in all countries and in all sports, but at least the framework now exists. What is especially important to remember in all this is that the anti-doping rules are sport rules, just the same as any other rule in sport. That is to say, they are accepted by all participants as the applicable rules. Now, there are some athletes and some of their entourage who simply don't care about the rules, and they're willing to use whatever means they consider necessary to win. When you analyze it from this perspective, they are nothing more than sociopathic cheats, and they deserve to be dealt with accordingly. Cheating is not accidental. It is a deliberate attempt to take advantage of those who do play in accordance with the agreed-upon rules, and to gain an unfair advantage from that cheating. I should mention that when I first became involved in the fight against doping in sport, and it is a fight, uh, the people whose job it was to defend the cheaters managed to position the conduct of their clients as the imaginative response, sometimes a whimsical response, of someone fighting against some form of monolithic system which was heavily skewed against imaginative rebels. The other was that the disqualification of a cheater was the juridical equivalent of a death sentence, and that the burden of proof on the part of the sports authorities seeking to remove a tawdry cheater from the competition was the equivalent of the criminal burden of proof beyond all reasonable doubt. Both of these extraordinary propositions require examination. What is this so-called system which operates to coerce the poor cheater. Is it really an amorphous system to limit their possibilities of being as fast or as strong as they might wish to be? Not at all. It is designed to make sure that the sport rules to which every participant agreed to conform have been properly and evenly applied. The rules are designed to protect those other athletes who have competed in accordance with the rules everyone agreed to, including the cheaters, that they are not designed, 
The rules are not designed to enable the cheaters to cheat at will and then to complain when they're caught that the system is unfair. As to the burden of proof, cheating in sport, including doping, is generally not a criminal matter unless the, the substances or methods have been made criminal in a non-sport context. Cheating in sport is a violation of the sport rules. I've never been one who thinks that a cheater, even one who dopes, should go to jail. I think there's just no place in sport for him or her, and all I want is that he or she be removed so that those who have honored their promises can get on with sport as it should be played. The rules themselves are administrative rules, not criminal rules, and the burden of proving an offense need not be proof beyond all reasonable doubt. We have settled on a, a test uh, which is called reasonable satisfaction as the appropriate level, which falls somewhere between proof beyond a reasonable doubt and a balance of probabilities. It's closer to uh, the criminal burden than the civil, but, but it's less than the criminal. Another remarkable proposition that we often hear is that the results of a, a doping infraction should be kept confidential. That someone who is discovered as having cheated should never be publicly exposed as a cheater. Um, I certainly don't mind, and in fact approve, of a, a certain level of initial confidentiality at the early stages. But once the offense has been approved, there is every reason uh, to be sure that this is publicly known even if only for its deterrent effect. Young people should know that someone they may have regarded as a hero has been exposed as a cheat and unworthy of their respect. One of the great problems we face, especially, but far from exclusively in North America, is the example set by the professional sport leagues. Not one of them is willing to say that it doesn't care whether players use drugs or not. Indeed, most of them are quite pious about drug-free sport and purport to have effective anti-doping policies. In fact, however, their actions demonstrate that they are not serious. Indeed, their actions make it clear that players understand that to get to the top of the leagues, it is necessary to use drugs, that it is highly unlikely you will get caught, and if they do happen to get caught, the sanctions are so minimal that the risk is more than worthwhile. As an example, a good program of anabolic steroids will produce performance benefits to an athlete lasting four to five years. In the Olympic movement, getting caught means a sanction of at least two and up to four years. In Major League Baseball, it is less than a third of a season. In the NFL, the gap between what is said and what is done is even greater. A positive test results in a four-game suspension, and there are complaints from the players that it should only be two games. This is practically an invitation to cheat. Of course, here at home, we set an even worse example. The CFL does not even allow its players to be tested. The revelations seeping out from Major League Baseball make it clear that it's not just the journeyman players who are using drugs, but the stars. McGuire, Sosa, Rodriguez, Clemens, Bonds, Ortiz, goes on and on. The main efforts of Major League Baseball seem not to be directed at how to deal with the problem, but how to prevent the public from knowing how rotten things have become. Some of you may recall a recent incident when I tangled with organized religion in Canada, namely the National Hockey League. I suggested that perhaps up to 30% of the National League hockey players might be using performance-enhancing drugs. Well, what a hornet's nest that stirred up. Pundits said that I had no basis for saying that because there were no test results to back it up. That part was certainly true. There were no test results because the NHL would not allow its players to be tested. They actually said, believe it or not, that there was no reason to have tests in the NHL because hockey players didn't use performance-enhancing drugs. Duh. <laughs> Their, the league media spinners tried to pitch their response by saying that I had said that 30% of the players use steroids, which is not what I said. I had referred to all of the drugs, including stimulants, which are, if I may be so bold, notorious in hockey. I was amused that a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the, the Russian players uh, in the NHL, I think it was Ovechkin, but I'm not sure, 
He was interviewed on a television show about uh, the excitement of playing a game in Montreal. Uh, he said Montreal was always a special place to play and that for games in Montreal, you didn't even have to use Red Bull. Well, what, what the players do to themselves with the drugs they take is one thing. Uh, another, more insidious outcome, is the example and the message sent to young athletes. The stars do it. They are stars. No one cares. So if I want to be a star myself, this is what I have to do. And this is a message that trickles down through the leagues and down to kids in high school. It's an outrageous abdication of responsibility by the professional leagues. And it's not just the leagues themselves, the, you know, the, the owners and so on that are at fault. The players are equally guilty, and the players' associations are a huge part of the problem, fighting every advance in the efforts to produce drug-free sport. From an ethical perspective, I believe that doping is the single greatest threat to the integrity and future of sport. No one should have to become a chemical stockpile in order to be successful in sport, simply because there are sociopaths who have no respect for the rules which they accepted for the game or for their opponents. Look what's happening to the professional entertainment sports. No one cares, even though they should, but no one cares what the professional gladiators do to prepare themselves. Lip service is paid to drug-free sport, but nothing effective is done to put teeth into the rules. Look at baseball. Look at football. Look at hockey. Look at basketball. Is what you see real competition in accordance with the rules? As the ethical standards within these sports decline, we see that it spreads into further corruption, such as betting and match fixing. And these have increased dramatically. Uh, for those of you with a, an historical bent, you may recall that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, some very popular sports simply disappeared when the public lost confidence in the integrity of the competitions. It could happen in this century as well. I regard the gender issue as a subset of ethics, and, and I have been, since I became a, a member of the International Olympic Committee, someone who has always promoted the participation of women in the games, but also in the administration of sport. It's no coincidence that Canada has been a leader in this, and that Canada had one of the early female IOC members, an early Canadian Olympic Committee president, and several chefs de mission of our Olympic and Pan American Games teams, including the current chef de mission, Natalie Lambert. The only two Canadian athlete members of the International Olympic Committee have been women. And I think the progress over the years has been significant, although it's very clear that more work remains to be done. The approaches to achieving gender parity are not without complexity, and they need to be strategic at this stage. In the recent controversy regarding women's ski jumping at the forthcoming games, I believe there was a lack of strategic thinking which resulted in adopting a confrontational approach, which never, trust me as a lawyer, it never had any chance of success. And it risked setting back progression towards Olympic inclusion back rather than forward. I hope that its proponents have learned from the experience and will direct their efforts in a more productive fashion in future. The base from which they must build is within their own sport, not the Canadian courts. Technology. Competitive sport, as opposed to mere recreational sport, involves frontiers. The effort to extend human performance beyond what has ever been achieved to date. When I talk about technology here, I, I include the application of the scientific method or endeavor in all its forms, not simply mechanical uh, devices or equipment. So this includes technique, strategy, physical conditioning, equipment, field of play improvements, nutrition, counseling, competition, biomechanics, and sports medicine. And I must say that generally I favor the application of technology in sport, so long as technology adds to the human physical performance and does not replace or minimize it. Uh, the addition, for example, of safety features is, is always to, to be encouraged and welcomed. Physical conditioning and sports medicine minimize injuries and speed recoveries. Developing a positive mental attitude improves sport performance. Since often, and those of you who have been athletes will know, since often the greatest barriers 
are self-created. Fear of winning can be as large a hurdle as fear of losing. But as, as in all things related to sport, technology can also get out of hand. Uh, I must say, uh, as an example here, my former sport, swimming, provides a case in point with the ultra-high-tech swimsuits that have emerged in the past couple of years. Uh, they cost a fortune, they change the resistance of the body to water, and they actually alter the body shapes of those who could afford to buy them and who can manage to get into them. <laughs> uh, the resulting performances, as we know and have seen, uh, have distorted the records. And the International Federation has finally stepped in to try and mitigate the damage and to ban the suits. Proper assessment of the likely results might have prevented the problem. But the Federation persisted in the face of clear evidence to the contrary for, for a number of years in saying that there were no untoward effects from the use of the suits. There is life after competition. Uh, it would be wrong to leave the impression, and I don't want to do so, that sports and those involved in it are not fine examples for others to emulate. Uh, I've talked so far about some of the risks that have to be managed, and I've identified some of the, the normal human frailties which are a fact of life and, and which can have negative impacts on sport. But the overwhelming majority of athletes benefit enormously from their participation in sport, they acquire disciplines and skills which serve them well throughout life, as well as during their sporting years. The same qualities and skills also inure to the benefit of the communities in which they live and work. Give me, give me any time a community of physically active persons who understand the need for self-discipline, goal-setting, hard work, focus, time management, performance measurement, and teamwork, and I've matched that community against any alternatives we care to put up. Statistically, my guess would be that former athletes are far more successful, far more likely to be involved in the community, far less likely to be a drain on it, and far better citizens generally than those without sport backgrounds. They also know that their success was only partly due to their own efforts, and that they got to be where they are or were as a result of the help of others, many of whom, if not most of whom, were volunteers. And in that respect, I think I'm typical of, of many athletes who know that they've drunk from a well dug by others and who feel a moral obligation to put back into that well at least as much as they drew out from it themselves during their sport careers. I believe as well that athletes have a greater responsibility than others to set good examples now, it may stem from our ancestral DNA, going back to the hunter-killer era, that people have an inordinate respect for and admiration of physical prowess. The societal, in some cases financial, rewards are, quite frankly, out of proportion to the physical achievements, but they're nevertheless real. And in that sense, the successful athlete gets some degree of free ride from society. He or she should be conscious of that and be willing to deserve it by setting an appropriate example. There should be a payback to an admiring society, and athletes should be more than willing to make it. Perhaps that should be the real ethical calculus of sport. Thank you very much. Dick, I wanted to start on one of the points that you raised that sort of got me when you mentioned it. I never quite thought about this. I've heard you compare uh, the uh, anti-doping legislation for Olympic athletes and for uh, the work, the type of work that you've done to some of the professional sports. You mentioned the Canadian Football League. You mentioned the eye closing that occurs in NHL. Do you think one of the reasons why this is such an important area is that people look at Olympic athletes in a different way than they look at professional athletes, that Olympic athletes have to be beyond reproach? Is it because of the code that we expect? Is there something to that? I, I think the great thing about the Olympics, and we have differentiated the brand, if you like, from the, the entertainment sport brand, is that they, they want the, the Olympics to work out. People want that to happen, and, and they're inordinately disappointed if there's a, a positive doping case at the Olympics. They don't care. 
about these professional sports. They should. I mean, because every one of these players is somebody's kid, somebody's neighbor. But uh, but there's a differentiation. They, they want the Olympics to work, and and it's a disappointment if somebody cheats at the Olympics. Right. So it is a, a higher ideal of, of some sort that we that we expect. Yes, it's it's more than just entertainment. It's it's, it's the whole aspirational quality of, of you know being out and competing in this once in a lifetime, sometimes twice in a lifetime chance of, of meeting the best athletes from everywhere in the world and seeing how you measure up. Right. Interesting. So Becky, when when you hear this and you hear Dick talk and all the work that he's done over the years uh, in, in the, uh, the World Anti Doping Agency, and you're competing, and you've got many other people in the race with you. And you know that some of them, some of them might be cheating. Maybe in some people that you might know, uh, you know, as friends or you thought were friends of yours. What goes on in your mind? I mean, you're trying to compete at the highest level. You're trying to win a medal for Canada. And yet you know that it might not be an equal playing field. How do you feel psychologically or even athletically you know, during that period? Uh, I think uh, there's a, a very profound level of frustration. I mean, a deep level of frustration. And, I mean, I think I, to, to draw an analysis or to, to make a, an equivalent scenario, it would be, you know, lining up at the start line of a 400 meter race around the track and with 10 other competitors, starting the race, trying your hardest, knowing you've trained and prepared and done everything you could, and watching two or three of them cut across the field and finish way ahead of you because they took a shortcut. And watching the officials turn their, <laughs> having missed it or, or not, uh, not looking, not having seen it. So you finish your race and you're out of the medals and you're not a contender. You've been humiliated by the, by the, um, I mean, the length of the distance that you were beaten by. And nobody said it worked because nobody saw it. And, uh, and that, to go back and do that again and again and again. And, uh, you know, to come from my personal experience, you know, I, I dreamt of be, being in the Olympics since I was five years old, and I did everything I could my whole life to towards that goal. It was a singular focus. And when I got to the international stage, you know, I heard the rumors and, and the talking, you know, and then gradually, every now and then, a revelation would come out. And, and the biggest one, I think, for our sport was in 2001 at the World Championships when, you know, the whole Finnish team just was positive. And, and it was just this. It's just, it's an unbelievably frustrating place to be, to know that you're doing everything you can, but you will only get to a certain level, because you will always be circumvented by people who are cheating. Mm -hmm. And yet you still, <laughs> you still were true to your spirit of, of not, not cheating. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, there was never an option or never a question of how I would go about doing it. It was just, uh, how could I do what I was trying to do, but also maybe try to make some changes in the system as well to allow that door to open somewhat rather than being clean and honest and doing things with integrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to take you both back to 2002 before we get to Jim, because I know everybody wants to know what is Gene Dolphin. <laughs> but let, let's go back to 2002. And you competed. I, I watched it. A lot of us watched it. It was amazing. We were so proud of it. <laughs> Winning the bronze, we were so proud. And we didn't know that something else would happen over the next little while. Very frustratingly, weeks, months, perhaps, mm -hmm. went on. So take us back to that. How did you feel, you know, after the race and then in the event that unfolded? Well, I mean, immediately after the race, I was overjoyed. You know, it was a bronze medal for Canada. It was the first medal ever in the history of our sport. I think we were optimistic it might happen, but nobody was, you know, thinking for sure it's going to happen. So it was, a, you know, it was putting together the perfect race on the perfect day and having everything happen the way it should or could and crossing the finish line first, you know, by a, a less than a tenth of a second against the woman who was fourth with me. You know, the, the first two were... We know why, um, <laughs> but, but so for myself, you know, like it, when I every now and then I, I catch a replay of the video of the, the medal ceremony, you know, and, and uh, I mean it was it was the highlight of my life at that point. I couldn't have been happier, and our whole team and our contingent we celebrated that like it was platinum. I mean it was just ex it was an extraordinary moment. And then um, on the last day that they show driving to the closing ceremonies, we got a call that the, the two women in that race had both tested positive, but at later races in the games. 
So it had come, you know, two or three days later, and then, uh, and that's when things started to, to roll on. So. All right, so I'm going to turn to Dick, and I, I don't know how much he's going to be able to disclose to us, but uh, <laughs> what was going on behind the scenes? I know you have, you know, the World Doping Agencies there, they're doing their testing, etc. You probably didn't get involved, with, you know, yourself personally, but what, what's going on during this period? Well, there was one additional layer of, of frustration was that one of the two, I forget, had already tested positive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they dragged out the appeal process to the point where, where there was no final decision, although you know what's going to happen. So we already knew, or were strongly suspected, that, that we're talking at least a silver medal. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, we know that EPO's out there, and, and we got a hold of this uh, Aranes, I think, was what they were using, or one of the variants, and, and it had only been on the, the market available for a matter of weeks, but we knew that we had a test for it, and I, I think that Muleg and the other uh, the Russian government, given the stuff, said, don't worry, there's, there's no test for this, you can take it with impunity, and we we're in the happy position of being able to say, surprise, guess what we found, and then the, the, the uh, my, the IOC, I think, made a huge mistake. They didn't say that the Olympic Games are a, a single event. You test positive. In, during the Games, all your results are out. They said, oh, well, no, she didn't test positive in this race. And, and we had to, the Canadians had to go to court, uh, in effect, as did the Norwegians, mm -hmm. to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this, this doesn't make sense. So eventually, when the Court of Arbitration for Thorpe said, you're right, the IOC was wrong, uh, we have the young lady here who's got a bronze, a silver, and a gold all in the same event. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the first bronze, yeah. silver, yeah. and gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're hoping. <laughs> I am a trivial pursuit person. Hopeless over the TV. So we have to turn to Jim because you just mentioned uh, that when you uh, test positive in one event, it really should go for all events. So that's more of a scientific question, Jim. Is that, is that correct? So, so you have to back up. Uh, and look at what is EPO. And is it true that, you know, once you take EPO for a period of time, uh, it lasts for a long time doing what it does? Well, the EPO is it's a natural occurring hormone. We all have it. And it uh, gets turned on in response, for instance, to hypoxia. So if you go climbing, you go up to three or 4,000 meters, you'll turn this gene on, you make a little EPO. And what it does is it just gives you a few more red blood cells, and that helps you carry oxygen. The red blood cells got a lifespan of about 120 days. So once you've taken the EPO, you get these extra red blood cells. It takes about six days for the cells to mature. And then you just up your oxygen carrying capacity. And in a sport like yours, a couple of, a couple of tiny sub percentage points of oxygen carrying capacity can be the difference between being, like you said, way up front <laughs> or very, very close. And that drug, um, I often use this whole story as an example of how rapidly these drugs and technologies spread among the athletes. Even though they've never gone through any kind of testing to show that they would actually work, mm -hmm. they just spread like wildfire. And that's one of the reasons there's a lot of interest in new, in new technologies. But EPO is essentially, is once you've taken it, um, it'll work for, probably work for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Now, there are differences, uh, I suspect, between EPO people who live, say, where Becky lives, uh, you lived in Alberta, right? You were training in, in, in Alberta uh, for mm -hmm. 2000, so you're, you're living there now, too, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, versus somebody, say, a, a biker that mm -hmm. trains up in the mountains. But what you're saying is that when you take it for these purposes, it's a very different level of what you see. Well, the challenge in detecting anything that's naturally produced in the body is that there are huge variations between people. Um, it's true for EPO, it's true for testosterone, it's true for the natural occurring steroids. And one of the problems in just using some kind of arbitrary threshold is that athletes, no offense, athletes are not in the middle of the normal curve. They're way out it's a curve here, <laughs> where the rest of us usually are not to be found. So if you, if you look at it, if you're trying to establish something based on a natural uh, Right. The level, it's likely not really going to be seen in the athlete. So what you have to look for is something that's different, something that doesn't reflect a natural uh, situation. So the synthetic erythropoietin, or synthetic EPO that they use, which sometimes you'll see called recombinant uh, human EPO because it's been made initially through genetic manipulation in cells, is subtly different from 
erythropoietin that actually exists in your body. It's that subtle difference that the test is based on. Mm. And one of, uh, I think, perhaps one of the shocks to the athletes who are taking the, this new derivative is uh, one bit of an edge you have in doping control is that the more you manipulate the hormone to make it behave differently than the natural hormone, like to make it last longer, uh, to be less toxic, the more different you make it from the natural hormone, and that makes it a little more easy to detect. So I think once they knew that that, that derivative of reflucoetin might be out there, it didn't take them long to come up with a way of, of very definitively saying, well, that's, that's it, and that gave them the pleasure of the, uh, no, we have a test. Right, and that was available in 2002. I, I think it had just come on the market in late 2001 or something like that. Right. But one of the things we, we started to do is, is to have better relations with the, with the ethical farmers. And we discussed the molecules they're working with and, right. and, and the tests and so on. So that, you know, the gap between the perpetrator and, and the ability to detect is has narrowed considerably. Mm -hmm. So then the other part of the story is that I think once the PTO was detected and, and the medals were uh, duly awarded, uh, the gold medal was duly awarded to you, I wasn't going to ask you to give back the bronze medal, by the way. I did. You did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then what was the response of the community, uh, of your skiing community? Uh, oh my God, did they know that EPO was uh, testable and uh, was there then discussions of the next thing that might be out there? Uh, I think one, one part of the doping culture is that people don't really talk about it. Mm. So even though you know these athletes had tested positive in in 2002, you know there was and then once the results of, of all the court of arbitration appeals and everything were revealed, you know I received a lot of congratulations from the community, the international ski community for sure, but. But nobody really went so, so far as to express any kind of, I think, more awareness about doping or, or speak out against it, which has been, you know, I think, an, an ongoing frustration of mine is that there really is very little um, willingness to talk about it, especially, yeah, at the sport level. But one of the things, going back to what Nick was talking about, which really resonated, was that what we started to hear around that time. 2002, 2003, 2004, and seen from professional athletes was the major change in body configuration that occurs with some of the doping that was going on, like the anabolic steroids. Uh, I hadn't realized, for example, that, your, that the cranium grows, you know, that, that there are bone changes that occur with anabolic steroids. Barry Bond's head is almost, it's got up two or three orders of hat size. My father was a habitasher, I know what that means. <laughs> uh, unbelievable. And what was going on in the playground, you know, at the same time when these young athletes were perhaps toying with the idea as middle linebackers and taking out of steroids. There seems to have become an awareness. And then all of a sudden, we start hearing about athletes coming forward saying, yes, we took it, but it was for control of uh, uh, injuries, uh, there were other excuses. Uh, uh, Mark McGuire just made an incredible speech about the fact that uh, he was in the era of anabolic stories. Where are we now, Jim, with anabolic stories? Well, I think there's still a there's still a real problem. Uh, I mean, an anabolic steroid is really just a derivative of an actual steroid. It's been modified primarily in the case of der a derivative of testosterone, just to allow you to take it orally. Because if, if you take testosterone orally, your liver just breaks it down. So one of the big problems with these drugs is they're quite easy to go in and make subtle changes in. They still work, and this is what Alco did. They still work, but they've never gone through any kind of clinical trial. No one really knows whether they're, they're going to really have profound side effects. Um, unfortunately, there's still athletes that will try and take them. So I think they're still out there. They're still going in. They're still being manipulated. The hope is to manipulate it such that you confound the test, that even if the testers uh, you know, of course, now it's all going to court. You know, if the tester knows that, well, there's something wrong here, if it doesn't actually meet the profile mm -hmm. of a prohibited substance, it gets a little harder when it gets to court to say, well, it's something. I don't really know what it is, but there's clearly something I don't like the look of there. So they start manipulating them, and uh, unfortunately, the athletes start taking them and take usually take too much of them because they're trying to get a very fast yeah, response. Yeah, so little is okay, a lot's probably better. Just like aspirin. Right, yeah. Take as much as you possibly can swallow. Not you know. <laughs> right. 
So, again, back to Dick's point, uh, how long before an event do you have to have anabolic steroids to increase your testosterone-like symptoms? Most of these you would take, you would take several months in advance because you're trying to put on both. And what most of the steroids, and it's not so much an instant ticket to, to muscle, it just increases your response to training. Mm -hmm. So you take the steroid and then, and then you would train. Right. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the most famous recent doping examples was Floyd Landis in the Tour de France. And one of the things people kept saying was, why would he take testosterone the day before the race? I mean, it's not going to do anything. But the other problem with testosterone is people will take it as an attempt, some of the steroids will take it as an attempt to, to speed up curing yeah. or, speed, or repair the muscle damage. So they may be taking it for other reasons. Aggressiveness. I mean, testosterone has got to be one of the most potent uh, hormones in the body for aggression. Apparently, one of the common uses now of testosterone uh, is in, in criminal gangs, and it's partly just to get big and menacing looking, but it's also just to get mean, just to get aggressive and to get that sort of in-your-face belligerence that, you know, makes you the, the big threat on the street. Oh. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's scary, actually. Here's my wallet. <laughs> yeah. Here's my wallet. Take that. <laughs> I have my birth certificate, my identity. Don't do anything else to me. But not my medal. Yeah. So, what's so interesting is that one of the sports is, I don't think you mentioned Dick, and we haven't talked about it yet tonight, uh, uh, cycling. And uh, over the last many years has been really uh, scarred uh, by uh, lots of uh, doping. Uh, when you go back into the history of cycling, I've been told by my friends from Europe, particularly from France, that uh, urine doping or, or changing urine when you were being tested was an old thing that happened years ago, and the technology has improved. Why don't you think we heard about anything last summer about doping in the Tour de France? I would, I, I, my guess, is, and I know as close to it as I used to be, is that um, cycling did the testing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cycling did the testing. I have another theory, and I wanted to try it on you and see. Uh, when I'm not the Executive Director of Community Affairs, I'm actually a pharmacologist. Uh, I've been trying to keep that hidden from you as I ask these questions. But one of the things we learned is what Jim just said, that anabolic steroids, for example, are steroids, and we have them in our body, they're normal, and we've been using them as medications for years, as corticosteroids. So in other words, not the male hormone-dominated type of uh, testosterone-like, but what we call corticosteroids which are used in arthritis. And years and years, and there'll be people in the audience that know this, people who in their families have taken steroids, corticosteroids, for alleviation of the symptoms of arthritis, were using very large doses. And we found out not so long ago, probably about 10, 15 years ago when it came to arthritis treatment, that a specific corticosteroid called, called prednisone could be used at a much lower concentration and still have the same effect. I wonder, whether the reason why we're not hearing so much anymore about anabolic steroids is that the athletes have figured out that they could use it at much lower doses where it can be massed easier. Could be there's certainly microdosing going on all the time, and I, I think that's what Landis was doing. He was yeah. popping up. Uh, I mean, the mistake I guess he made is he suddenly started to climb mountains like he was on a motorcycle. And people said, if it's too good to be true, maybe it's. Well, I should tell you that I walked the La Couturade this summer, where Floyd took off. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't even walk it. It was like this. So that's the other part. Are we expecting too much? Are we expecting too much? Is that a reason? And I know it's not an explanation. But are some of these achievements going to the point where people think they have to have an edge to, to do well? I think the incentive is to do well has always been there, you know, this is, this particularly with Olympic sports, like it's a, gold, a gold medal is the highest level you can get to as an amateur athlete. So, yeah. um, you know, the Tour de France certainly is, in many ways, an inhuman endeavor almost, you know, like the, the, what they're asking the athletes to do there in terms of the duration of the race and how many days they have without a rest. But, um, I don't think that we probably are expecting too much in terms of their athletic ability, but we, the incentive at the end of it all is, is so much so that I think it, it's a lot, of, a lot of them view it as worth the risk. Yeah. Jim, do you have a comment on it? Well, I think the tour is, is um, 
The tour is one of the oddest sports in the world, as being an, a very strange mix of cooperation and competition. So you have a team that's incredibly uh, dependent on you. You have a lead rider who is only going to win because you kill yourself for the first three quarters of the race to, to allow them to do that. So there's a huge incentive on the, the lower ranking riders to, to, to perform. And I think that that's, that's a real pressure. And then you've got a race that, that for 21 days they're going to ride 19 out of 21 days. That means you have to have 19, have 19 perfect days. You, you can't afford to have one bad day. One bad day, your team drops or your leader drops three minutes and that's the end of it. That's the end of it for that year. So I think among sports, the pressure in that must be, just must be enormous. Enormous. They must lose a terrific amount of weight as well during that, uh, that period. Well, they lose weight, they lose bone mass, they lose muscle mass. It's, it's grueling. It's, uh, it is probably the single hardest, you know, short of the extreme you know, run around the world kinds of things, but for the annual organized event, uh, I would, you know, you know, you may disagree, but I would say it's probably one of the toughest in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, All right, we're dying to hear it. What is gene doping? Gene doping is just the application of gene therapy to doping, just like most doping is the application of pharmacological therapy. And the idea behind gene doping is if you are wanting to dope with something that isn't natural, it won't only work for a natural occurring uh, substance, and it, it'll only really work if it's something that's a, that's a protein, like erythropoietin, which is a natural hormone. Instead of taking erythropoietin as a drug, you put in the gene, and, and genes are essentially nothing but little units of information that instruct the cells to make a, a product. So you take the gene that would instruct the, the cell to make erythropoietin, it releases the erythropoietin into the bloodstream, and you get your dose of erythropoietin. And you don't have to get shots, you don't have to buy the drug, you don't get this uh, sort of spike and then trough and then spike and then trough. So it would be an extremely efficient way to to treat disease, or if it's a, a disease, something like um, muscular dystrophy, to go back in and replace the defective protein. And people have been talking about it since the early 1970s as being you know, the future of medicine. And of course, like most of these things, as soon as somebody comes up with a legitimate use for it, people start thinking about, well, perhaps there's some illegitimate uses of it as well, and that's really where gene doping came in. Oh, interesting. So the legitimate uses that are available or medical uses for gene therapy are some of the blood diseases, like we, we, we mentioned uh, a boy in the bubble as being yeah. one of the ones, because we have to replace a specific gene that's not working in that uh, disease? Yeah, in that case, there was a gene missing. The, the children can't produce a natural, uh, it breaks a breakdown of the pathway that produces antibodies and the cells that produce antibodies, so we have no immune response. So it's a, it's a devastating condition, and it's a condition that's so serious that it warrants trying very, very experimental and potentially dangerous interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, erythropoietin is one of the most prescribed drugs in the world because kidney failure is very common, especially in older individuals, uh, and anemia secondary to chemotherapy or uh, radiation therapy is also very common. So that's who's getting the EPO. So if you can then just Treat you want. Basically, you treat the person once. If, if you really got the system fully refined and working perfectly, I would give it to you once. The gene would work its way into your cells, into your own chromosomes, and then under the same kind of control that your natural gene, which isn't functioning for some reason, mm -hmm. it would now just work. And you know, you would never have to be treated again. Now, if I could tweak that to turn it up a little bit for you, I could just get you, you know, maybe move you up from from normal to that little that little extra that we talked about, you need to be down at that end of the, the normal curve. You couldn't get me taller, right? <laughs> uh, are you familiar with Andrew the Giant? Uh, the well, wrestler? The no, okay. Andrew the Giant. No, the big wrestler? Oh, yes, I remember him. Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant. Yes, yes. Uh, the record was Andre the Giant. So he had, uh, he probably had excess growth hormone. And of course, growth hormone is one of the things that they think about for, for gene therapy, that you could put the growth hormone gene in. And of course, the therapeutic use is for people that are, for one of a better word, clinically short, other than just people who want to be tall. No, it's challenged, short challenge. Okay. <laughs> clinically, vertically challenged. Vertically challenged. And uh, so they can take growth hormone and, you know, they'll put, you know, bring them up to whatever five foot seven, five foot eight, five foot nine. You're not supposed to take it and make the person 
eight foot six because they want to get in the NBA. The problem is, of course, with all of these things, the moment you start overriding all the natural controls we've got in place, you start having problems. So Andre the Giant, if you looked at him, I mean, first of all, he, he died at a relatively young age, despite being a very fit individual. But he had overgrowth of the bones in his hands. He had that very, very heavy jaw. Um, exactly. Basically, and that's what you'd be inducing in an athlete. You'd be, you'd be sort of pushing them toward acromegaly, which is probably not what they want, because what they have in mind is, well, I'm just going to be four inches taller. No, just like I am, I'm just going to be taller. It doesn't really work that way, because you're overriding, you know, billions of years of very, very fine tuning to keep things at the right level. And yet, it might be the next thing. Yeah, it might be the next thing. Um, and that's certainly what is concerned. That the problem is, is these things can take a long time to go through clinical trials, but you know, the, these so-called rogue doping labs are not particularly concerned with clinical I've, I've, trials. We had a meeting with the whole the leading scientist, and there was a fellow called Lee Sweeney. That you would know. He's the one that, that did some manipulation and got laboratory rats to get 15 to 35 percent extra muscle without exercise. And he said, uh, you know, I, I get my email, email every day. He said, half of it comes from colleagues and friends and, and so on. He said, the other half comes from people in sport saying, Do we, we read this? Can, can we try this? We're involved. And he said, listen, do you understand it? I'm working in a lab with rats. <laughs> I have no idea what the morbidity or anything else would be on him. That's okay. Yeah, no, we'll try it. So how, how close do you think we are? If the doping, if doping applications of gene therapy sort of follow the natural progression where it gets into clinical use and then it gets moved to doping, I would say it's probably not immediate to, because, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing under, there's nothing being looked at uh, in clinical trials that I think would actually work as a doping agent, with the possible exception of erythropoietin, but I'm not sure if those trials are still ongoing. That's the sort of legitimate progression. If it actually is someone who decides that, well, I can make this. Not, you know, I've been in labs where I could, I could certainly make something. Um, and if I injected it in you, I, I get my money up front and then I disappear. Um, because what I don't have is the capacity to, to purify it to pharmaceutical levels. But you could certainly make something. And, and you know, and Balco certainly exposed the fact that people will make it and athletes will take it just based on the promise that, well, we think it'll work and we think it won't have too many side effects. So if, uh, I would say probably not immediate unless there really is the sort of rogue lab. Right. But it still responds to what Dick was saying that, yes, it might work, yes, it might be a leg up, but it's dangerous, it's going to affect uh, your well-being your life expectancy possibly, et cetera. So I guess we have to put it under the same rubric, that it's something that has to be uh, legislated and looked at very uh, very carefully. It is on uh, on the list, right? It, it is on the list, and, and uh, you know, some, some of the things that are on the list were put there long before there's a test that you say. Right. And, you, and you have the balance saying, well, if we put it on the list, people will think that it's useful, and therefore they'll, they're more likely to use it. Right. We're saying, look, we should just warn them that it's, that it's dangerous. And, uh, but on the, the Balco stuff, I mean, when Kelly Edwards came to the World Energy Doping Agency one time and described her stuff, taking the clear. And she said that this stuff went from the lab into a, a human body with nobody having the faintest idea of what the side effects were. Mm -hmm. She said she went, she was having two menstrual cycles a month. She was, uh, she had blood pressure that was going through the roof. And she said, hey, look up, this is what's happening. She said, take a little less and maybe drink some more water. It's, you could kill people doing this, and with the genetic manipulation, the risks are even higher, I think. Of course, and with the genetics, well, depending on the strategy you use, it's a, a one-way trip. You can't get it back out. Mm -hmm. It goes in there, it takes that erythropoietin gene, and sticks it on your chromosomes, and every cell. Yes. Now, now that, one thing I should clarify, is it's not going to get passed on to your offspring. That would be another whole you level. But, um, but it will, you know, you, you can't get rid of it. And this, this raises a, a real problem with, uh, with how, do you, how do you deal with it? If somebody gets caught gene doping, well, they've, they've permanently improved, if it works, they've permanently improved themselves by doing this. You pretty much have to say, well, you've, you're never, you're not capable of not doping. You are permanently doped. And yeah. If you can't compete now, you can't compete ever. I wonder, though, whether this is where the testing is going to become really difficult. 
Uh, one of the examples I guess I can point out is that I was on a, uh, a group that uh, looked at what to measure uh, with genetically modified organisms, which also is a gene change. So it's where specific genes, unlike our hybridized wheat that we fed the world with for so many years, um, gene uh, the, the gene uh, genetically modified organisms is one small genetic change that can occur uh, to you know, make a plant much more uh, able to withstand drought or to uh, withstand pesticides, etc. And the question that came from people uh, from the food agencies, what are we going to measure? Uh, do we need 20 tons of this stuff in order to, to isolate that difference, that little change? So that might be a huge problem there when it comes to water and uh, the testing that must go on. Well, it, it's certainly a challenge, and then we've got some of the leading genetic scientists in the world working on it, and, and they think that the future is some kind of a screening test, and, and it's based on, Jim has been saying, the home it's, it's a pretty complex organism in the body, and, and, right. and if, you, if you push here, there's going to be something else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. The other thing we're trying to do is, is to develop the, the concept of a, of a profile, personal profile, mm -hmm. testosterone levels, right. uh, all these things, and, and, and use that baseline, the, the passport, they're going to call it, uh, as a basis for saying, excuse me, but all of a sudden your hematocrit level's gone from 35, which has been for 10 years, to 55. How do you explain that? Mm -hmm. And use that as a, as a the means of imposing a sanction. Interesting. So, Becky, do you see any problems with that, or do you think that that can be something like a profile, which means that they'd have to follow you for a period of probably years rather than months to mm -hmm. make sure that they know who Becky Scott is? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I'm all for it, and I have been supporting it for a long time. The concept has actually been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, we had this year, for the first time ever, an athlete convicted on, the, on indirect evidence by the use of blood profiling, like watching, you know, different levels of spike and go up and down at, you know, big events. And uh, she was handed a two-year sanction, so, you know, I'm all for it. I think it, it is an important, because we know that EPO is, is, is hard to detect. It is easy to get around. It is, you know, in some of the endurance sports, it's, uh, you know, the drug of choice and not necessarily People just aren't getting caught for it, so what's the next step? It's to look at the indirect evidence and try to convict them on those bases. Interesting. So, Jim, do you think it's worthwhile? Oh, I, think, I think the passport is probably the way to go because it gets away from the fact that threshold values that represent the entire population can be meaningless to the individual. And in your sport, you're probably familiar with the Finnish skier Rero Mantaranta, who skied in the, in the 1960s. Well, he had a, he had a natural occurring. Uh, variant in not the gene that makes erythropoietin, but the gene that makes the receptor that erythropoietin acts through. By any measure you would take, he'd be joking. His blood count was really high, um, but that's what he was. You know, his entire life he would have had that high level, and I think it would be unfair to ban him from race, uh, from, from from competing. And in fact, it might be you know it might be a violation of, uh, of genetic discrimination. Mm -hmm. So if you just monitor for his entire life. You would never see a deviation from that, and you would just establish essentially that is what he is. Oh, there's a legal question in terms of that. Uh, this, this, is, this is not going to be easy, um, and, and we're wrestling with it uh, all the time as to what is an appropriate sanction if you find this. Uh, I mean, all, all of the, the guidelines we've used for the, you know, testosterone, epitestosterone ratios are way off the charts before you get up uh, anywhere near a doping. Again, what we found was. And when it was six to one, people were just playing, and they'd get up to you know, 5.9 and keep it there. Move it down to four, all of a sudden, all 3.9. That's 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 the risk you get into on a statistical basis. Whereas if you can get a profile for everybody, mm -hmm. and then say, look, I'm sorry, what we're testing, what we see right now, is not the real you. Wow, you're looking for the sudden change. Uh, so that's the smoking pistol, it's the, and it can't be accounted for. So if you have a, an increase in your red blood cell count, and then you want, here's my ticket, so I was up to Machu Picchu, I was in Cusco for three weeks, well, that may be a, a reason that your blood cell count is up, and that's okay. But if you can't produce that, there's no reason for it just to suddenly pop up, yeah. especially just before an event. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody said, we well, are playing through over the Alps. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I want to ask all three of you as we start winding down our dialogue, and, and we will continue because we're, we have a chance at a reception to continue talking about these things. 
But do you think, uh, from your different perspectives, that doping is going to be an issue in this Olympics? This Olympics? An issue, of course it will. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I would never operate on the assumption that everybody participating in these games is, is clean. Uh -huh. We may not catch them all because uh, you know, have, you'd have to catch them during the, uh, the period of preparation, and that's why you need a rigorous uh, competition testing program. But uh, if, if there are any traces here, we have state-of-the-art uh, ability to detect it. All the race day drugs will be detectable. But uh, is it 100% clean? I'm afraid human nature doesn't allow you to conclude that. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not that I think in athlete circles, in competition testing is sometimes referred to as IQ testing. Because if you, if you really said I've done all the doping, any you know, chance of getting caught would have been done before you get to the job. competition. Exactly. <laughs> so, do I think people will be getting caught at these games? Probably not. And if they are, then it's they've made a major gap. Most of the doping has taken place beforehand, which is why, you know, WADA now has the whereabouts program and why out of competition testing is so important. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, anyway. But they're not well it'll be a problem here. Most likely not. I don't think we'll see many positive tests. So we'll concentrate on the athletics and not the yeah. news, <laughs> and the news conferences. <laughs> what do you think so? I think it'll be there that people will have it sometimes just as an emergency, just as a backup. Um, and I think the testing is now getting very, very good. Um, that's a, a significant disincentive to, to try something unless you really think, you, you know, you just, you just, it's going to be nothing. So you'll take the, you know, one last shot, take the risk. But I think, I think Becky's very much correct. This is all done way in advance and, uh, you know, like a, your IQ test is perfect because this is not, you know, this isn't just, oh, I'm feeling lousy, I'm just going to stick the needle in my arm. This is very, very carefully thought out, very scientifically engineered for the most part to optimize the results without getting caught. There's a lot of pretty good brains involved in this. There's a lot of money on the line, but uh, I certainly would like to see it. Mm -hmm. like to see no one get caught and not to think no one got caught simply because they got away with it. Yeah. One, one footnote, one Olympic footnote, is that we keep the samples now for eight years. Right. And if we find a, a test, for example, that will allow us to go back farther than we normally can for info, uh, and we think somebody's uh, probably done that here, we've got the sample for another eight years. And, and the right to sanction them. Mm -hmm. So you may get out of town with the medal, but... You've been involved at the forefront of this area of trying to develop anti-doping anti -do anti methods. The, the anti-doping agency was based in Montreal, I'm sure you, uh, because of your work, and uh, it's not totally, but, uh, you know, as a commendation. Um, are you happy with where we are? Uh, are you, when you look back, uh, do, you, do you think that we are where you want it to be, or is, are there ways to go yet? I'm happier. Uh, I don't think we're, we're there yet. I, and one of the things that I try to do is to get in the face of people and, and, and make it clear that there was a lot of this stuff going on and that there hadn't been meaningful response and that there would have to be a meaningful response. And, and I don't think that doping's going to let go away if we all hold hands and go, oh, mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think you've got to confront cheaters. It's, it's a planned and deliberate exercise, as, as Jim has just mentioned. It, it has to be confrontational and educational. Mm -hmm. In the long run, that's the answer. You've got to persuade people not to do it and, and let them know that if, if somebody does it, you'll catch them. Very interesting. Well, Dick, Becky, Jim, thank you so much for your participation tonight. Thank you. Sport and Society was produced by the University of British Columbia and recorded live at the UBC Chan Center for the Performing Arts. Intellectual Muscle was developed by Vancouver 2010 and the University of British Columbia in collaboration with universities across Canada and the Globe and Mail.